Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So in this session, we're gonna talk about building office add-ins using Node.js. So let me just set the stage real quick before we kind of dive into this. Um, I'm taking the approach here that, the, uh, that you're here to learn a little bit about Node.js, that you're not as familiar with what that is, and then also uh, maybe to also learn a little bit about how to do um, office add-ins. So I'm gonna show you an extension to Outlook that's all written uh, using um, Node.js. It's written using TypeScript. It'll compile down to JavaScript, and it'll also um, leverage Angular uh, inside of the application. So I'll go ahead and dive in, get started. Um, first, my name is Andrew Connell. I'm here with my co-presenter, Jeremy Thake, that is a little bashful to stand up from behind the stage. So we'll just go ahead and uh, go ahead here. I'm just kidding. So Jer it was, this session's just me. It's not uh, me and Jeremy. Um, so let me get to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the, the developer vision, the developer vision for Office 365, what's Microsoft's, um, or what's the Office team's um, uh, perspective and what, what is their goal here with this, is that they wanna make it to where it's really easy for people to interact with their data no matter where they are. So uh, the idea behind having Office add-ins is that we don't wanna have to, like say for example, if we have a tracking number for a shipping package that's emailed to us, we don't wanna have to copy that value and go leave our email and go look in the, uh, the shipper and go find the information about where our package is. I'd like to just, while I'm within the email, it's gonna, the email is smart enough to detect that it sees a tracking number for a shipper that I can click on and it'll show me the tracking information right in context of the email. So that's the user side. The other side is that with the data piece, it wants to be able to give me the, the ability to take data from multiple sources and integrate it into custom applications. And with many of us using Office 365, we have a lot of our enterprise data inside of Office 365, so I wanna be able to leverage it within my apps. So what am I gonna go through today? So first, I'm gonna um, kinda go a bit of a fire hose, and I've got a lot of content in the slides, but I'm gonna kinda go over it kinda a little topical. Um, the slides are gonna be there for your reference to go look up some stuff. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is Node.js, and then you might have heard of this thing of what is IOJS. Uh, talk a little bit about the developer tooling for Node.js, creating websites and web APIs with Node.js, developing for Node.js, and then Node for Office and SharePoint add-ins. So we'll go ahead and get started. What is Node.js? So essentially, Node.js is a runtime that lets us do JavaScript on the server. Uh, for me, this is very appealing. I like to do a lot of web-based client uh, applications, and the really only way to do that is with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to be a most cross-platform, hit all the different uh, devices and browsers. That's the best way of doing uh, web-based applications. Uh, but it always felt a little weird for me to always have to, when I do something server-side, to jump into a different language. Um, doesn't matter what you're using, C Sharp, PHP, Ruby, whatever. Um, when you're building different uh, web-based applications, you've gotta do different server-side technologies. What I really like is the fact that Node.js lets me do JavaScript on the server and in the client, so I'm using one language across the entire stack, and as I'll show you, my build setup and my uh, process of running all my tests and everything, that's all done in JavaScript as well. So one language to do absolutely everything um, in my application makes it a lot easier. Um, Node.js is really intended to be used for like IO-based or networking, network-based applications. If you've got a lot of like computation that you need to run, like a lot of calculations and analytics and stuff, Node.js or specifically JavaScript, probably not the best thing for you. So what a lot of people are doing is they're building back-end services and exposing that logic through a REST API uh, and then using uh, Node or something like Node to have like the web layer or the API layer that talks to those services and exposes them um, to the calling applications. Node.js is open source. It's managed by a uh, company called uh, JoinNet, um, and it's also trademarked by JoinNet. And then just recently, we have a thing called the Node.js Foundation. You can learn more about it at nodejs.org. But who else uses Node.js? A lot of really big companies. And I've just linked to some of the different articles that talk about these different companies that are using um, Node.js. Uh, Azure, if you're doing Azure websites, you can have an Azure website that's, using, that's running Node.js. In fact, we are using Node for the Azure command line interface, the cross-platform inter uh, admin interface for dealing with Azure and managing your Azure assets. So you could take advantage of that as well. People like Azure, Yammer, Walmart, PayPal, LinkedIn, Trello, um, it's a really popular platform among a lot of these uh, different companies. Um, I've seen things with like PayPal where they're really uh, 
a lot of developers are really interested in doing something new, and so they like to take advantage of something like uh, Node.js. So what makes up Node? Well, Node is the, essentially the runtime, but it's also a bit of a wrapper and an API around something called V8. V8 is Google's uh, JavaScript uh, runtime that we have in the Chrome browser um, or in Chromium. And what Node does is it essentially hosts that for on a server-side implementation. Uh, for those of you .NET developers, we have a thing called NPM. You're familiar with something called NuGet. And that's our package management that we use in the .NET platform. What NPM is, is it's our, it's our package management system for uh, Node. So you want to be able to pull in new, repo new, new libraries and new uh, components into your application. You use NPM to pull that stuff in. It's a Node package manager. But then you might have heard of this thing called IOJS. Well, what is this? So there's a lot of heated debate around this. There's a lot of opinions around it. So I'm going to give it to you just company line as best I can. Um, Node.js is managed by the Node.js Foundation. Really, it was run by JoinNet for a while, but recently it's run by Node.js Foundation. And that's really in response to a lot of the stuff that's come up because of IOJS. Now, Node.js is currently using, is, the current version we're on is 0.12.2, unless that's changed in the last few days. And it uses the, the V8 engine 3.28.73. Why is that important? Well, I'll come, to that, I'll come back to that in just a moment. What is IOJS? IOJS is a fork of Node.js. So why did they fork it? Well, in 2014, the con contributions and the release schedule of Node.js really started to slow down quite a bit. Now, why that is, I'm going to leave other people to go through and give their reasons and blame and everything. But the community was getting a little frustrated and wanted to see more innovation and faster innovation and faster releases. So they first created this thing called Node Forward, and then they eventually renamed it to IOJS. And late in 2014, they forked Node.js and said, you know what? We're going to take our ball. We're going to go elsewhere. And we're going to do a lot of work with it. So a lot of the top contributors to Node.js went to IOJS. Um, I've got a link up there where it talks a little bit about some of the frustrations and stuff and some of the articles of why you actually have some stuff out there. The current version is 1.6.4, and it uses the V8 engine 4.1.0.27. Why is that interesting? Well, because the one, the version that we have of V8 back in Node, the current present version of Node, has some uh, performance issues and a couple bugs that have, that have not been resolved, or in that version they're not resolved, and it only uses ECMAScript 5, the current version of JavaScript that we generally call JavaScript. But what IOJS has done is they've actually gone through a lot of the backlog with Node.js, they've added a lot of the features and a lot of the bugs and fixed, or not added the bugs, they fixed a lot of the bugs that we had in Node.js. Those things are all fixed and updated in IOJS, and we're using the latest version of V8, or one of the more recent versions of V8, which has, is just a lot more performant than the one that Node.js uses, and it supports ECMAScript 6. So that's a, big de that's a bit of a big deal if you want to do uh, uh, ES6 style JavaScript on the server. Um, it's also very compatible with NPM. So right now, we're kind of going in two different directions. So I have down there on the slide, what will the future uh, hold? There's, rec there's uh, reconciliation efforts that are trying to go on. Really, it's up to you. Which one do you want to use? It's really up to you. The big guys, like Walmart and those guys, they're using uh, Node.js, right? They're using Node.js. A lot of other people are starting to use IOJS. Um, I think like the Atom editor even uses IOJS. So it's up to you. Just know that those are two things out there. That's the quickest kind of what's the difference between the two. You really can't go wrong which one you choose. All right. So just a little uh, show you a little bit what I mean here by the contributions. This is a screenshot from GitHub from the uh, contribution activity for Node.js. And I want you to take note of the last section there where it talks about 2014 and 2015. Notice how the activity is starting to kind of decline from previous uh, years. Well, let's flip it over and let's look at IOJS and take a look at that spike on the far right end. This is the exact same graph you saw a second ago because recall, it's a fork of Node.js. But what you're seeing is a lot more activity in IOJS over the same period that Node.js was on a decline. And that's because there's a lot of more community involvement on that side. So I think the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Where's all the innovation happening? Again, you just make up your mind which one you want to use. I've talked a little bit about this already. What's the appeal of Node.js and IOJS? Again, one language used from server to client, top to bottom. I like that. Same language used in your projects and your ecosystem around all, around all the projects. 
Um, and what I mean by that is that on the client, I'm doing JavaScript work for my browser to create client-side applications. On the server, I'm using the same language, JavaScript. I can also, and like say if I'm doing a .NET app, if I want to automate my build process, what does Microsoft traditionally use? We use MS Build. How do you define things in MS Build? You do it using tasks. Those tasks are defined using XML. It's more like configuration. But there's diff with uh, different libraries that we have and different build systems we have in the JavaScript world, there's one called Gulp. Um, that is uh, all done using JavaScript. So I define my build engine all using JavaScript. I write my server-side logic using JavaScript. I write my client-side logic using JavaScript. There's an appeal to that. I write all my tests using JavaScript, all the same language. Another thing, too, is it's cross-platform. There's a runtime for Node.js, for Windows, for OS X. It runs also for Linux as well. It runs in Azure websites, Heroku, AWS. Um, I have an express talk that I'm doing this week. I did one earlier today. I'm going to do it again tomorrow about down in the Office 365 um, express talk area where I'm showing how we're running the exact same applications that I'm showing you today, running it on a Raspberry Pi. No code changes at all. The only change I made was a configuration change on the IP address that that device got from the network. So when I start up the web server, it knows what to listen for. Because as you'll see, we're going to be using, and one of the ones I used, I used Azure AD. He needs to know where to route you back when you have a successful auth. All right, so let's talk about some of the tooling options we have here. In Visual Studio, they have tooling, the Node.js tools for Visual Studio. There's some sessions on that this week at Build. Uh, Microsoft also has Web Matrix. Um, you also saw this week there was an announcement around Visual Studio Code. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code to kind of show off my sample here. Um, it's really appealing. Um, I used to also use WebStorm. That's another tool that's out there, really good JavaScript editor uh, and IDE. Uh, Brackets is a JavaScript editor that's kind of meta in the sense that it's built using JavaScript. So you wrote JavaScript to write an editor to help write more JavaScript. It's a bit meta. Right? It's kind of like, what would happen if you pulled your eyes out and faced them at each other? What would you see? I don't know. Um, you can use any text editor. It really doesn't matter, OK? That's my point. Um, what about using Node.js for websites and web APIs? Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as I kind of get into this, as we talk about some of the things about developing Node. When I'm using Node.js for building websites and doing different web APIs, there's a couple different things you want to look at. And I'm not going to dive into too much depth here. I want to spend a little more time talking about the Office add-ins and the doing the demo. Um, here's the way it works. You've got a couple different components. You have a thing called Connect. You have a thing called Express. We all know what MVC is. We do ASP.NET MVC. We can do MVC apps, uh, web apps, using Node as well. And we want to be able to use Node to build APIs, like REST APIs. One of the things you'll see about Node is that you basically, when you get the runtime, you get a very bare bones thing. There's not a whole lot to it. You're going to want to go grab a few things pretty quick to start building up your application. But what that means is that while you feel like, ah, oh, I'm doing this, I'm getting Express again to do a web server, ah, oh, it's taking me, I don't, I don't need this, I, why do I have to do this every time? Because maybe you don't want to do a web server, maybe you just want to host RESTful services. You're thinking, well, I do need a web server for that. No, not really. There's a node package called, uh, I think it's RESTify, that is only there for hosting RESTful services to make your life easier. So you have to deal with all the other stuff around a web server. What is Connect? Well, the way that Node works is it's a single-threaded thing that just kind of every time you're just always going through a loop. And whenever you want to do something that's multi-threaded, you have callbacks that you can pass back in. What middleware does is that kind of as you're going through, think about it kind of like a pipeline. As you're going through the entire request stack, you can stick stuff into this pipeline where you want things to run. What Connect is, in, in, the stuff that you put inside that pipeline, those things are called middleware. It's just code that's going to run, and you don't go to the next step until that middleware is done. Connect is middleware for Node.js that is essentially helping you do requests and responses uh, over HTTP. It's a very extensible HTTP server framework. You can take advantage using plugins. There's a lot of different plugins that are out there. It's additional middleware for, um, from, uh, for Connect. Um, it's, again, you can think about that the middleware or the plugins as like living in this pipeline or living in a stack. Um, each thing is going to get executed one by one. It doesn't go to the next one until that first one is finished. And you call the callback to tell the hoster that, hey, I'm done with this section, to go to the next one. You do that inside your own middleware. Um, like example, for the example here, you see that once I've created my app, 
So I've at the top there, I've got var app equals connect. And then farther down, I say use slash foo. So when there was a request for foo, I want you to run this code. And I'm passing in a function that's going to get three parameters in, a request object, a response object, and a, and a callback, which I called next. I'm going to do all my code, and then I'm going to actually uh, call next when I'm done to go additionally down the pipeline. So don't stop the process of the web server. What is Express? Well, what Express is is a minimalist web framework. It's going to be built on top of Connect. It's very unopinionated in the sense that I can use all these different things and mix and match all these different things inside of my application. Um, we write the plumbing code for handling things. When a request comes in, I want you to run this function. I, when, a, um, when, when someone goes to this specific route, I want this to force authentication. I'm going to use a thing called Passport which is the very popular way of doing authentication in Node, to uh, uh, handle different authentication models. There's Passport, there's Passport for OAuth, then there's Azure, um, Azure AD has a model also for um, extending off of the OAuth support that we have uh, in Passport. When I said it was extensible, I really meant it, in the sense that I have multiple choices for different MVC framework options. And this is a list of a bunch of the different options. Now, this is very much like a religious war to me in the sense that um, by default it seems that what everybody uses is Jade. Um, I wasn't too much of a, I'm not too much of a fan of Jade because I feel like I'm writing like funky HTML and I have to learn a special HTML language. That's not really my style. Um, so it's a unique kind of HTML shorthand and uh, it's up to you if you want to do that. Another one is EJS. You can think of that as embedded JavaScript and it's kind of like saying I'm putting JavaScript inside of HTML or HTML inside of JavaScript. That, to me, feels a little weird. Another one is Vash. Now, this one really was kind of conflicting to me, because when I, when I learned about Vash, I was like, oh, that looks just like MVC Razor. Like, or sorry, ASP.NET Razor. Like, that's, I love that syntax. I started using it, but then I found that I thought that I was like the only person that was using it, aside from the guy that was authoring it. And when I had a problem, I kind of had to wait for him to wake up to respond to my questions. So I didn't feel like there were too many. You know, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating, but there weren't too many of us that were using it. So I was like, ah. Another one that we have, though, is handlebars. If you're familiar with using Angular, the, the data binding that we have in Angular uses a handlebars-style syntax with those double curly brackets on the ends. Handlebars is a pretty uh, uh, popular client-side um, data binding uh, language or uh, syn uh, syntax. And what I'm doing here with um, what handlebars is doing, uh, I use something called HBS. HBS is handlebars on the server, all right? So what about debugging node applications? There's a couple different things that we could take advantage of. These are, I would recommend you go to like search for these different things, look on YouTube for a couple different videos. Um, pretty cool, but let me explain what these are. Um, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead too quick. That first one, node dash dash debug, what that does is it says, go run this process. So I say node, and I'm gonna pass in a script, go run this process, but dash dash debug is like the equivalent of running in Visual Studio, running in debug mode. And so it opens up an additional port and will emit a lot more information in uh, the actual contents of the scripts that it's running. Um, you can use another thing called uh, Node Inspector. And what Node Inspector is going to do is it's going to allow you to, it's going to essentially allow you to open up um, a, uh, the Chrome browser and use the Chrome developer tools to do JavaScript debugging and breakpoints and everything inside of your Node.js applications. It just uses that for the debugging locally. So you do, Node, uh, node, node debug, and then you turn on Node Inspector, and then you run Node debug, and then you open up a Chrome browser and point to this URL, and essentially the whole window turns into the Chrome de de developer tools. Nodemon is very useful. What Nodemon does is that every time you make a change to your JavaScript files in the source and the server, while your web server's running, well, it's not going to pick up those, those changes, because when the web server started, it compiled everything, and everything's running in, is going to run in memory, or when the requests come in. What I need to do to get those changes to take effect is I need to shut down my node process and then restart it to pick up all the changes that I made. Well, that's going to kind of add some time to, the, to my development here. What Nodemon does is that Nodemon will detect those changes and automatically shuts down and restarts my, my uh, node server. So the combination of Nodemon and Node Inspector can be really, really helpful um, in uh, working on um, your node applications. Another one that's kind of like going, all right, let's, let's go get some super powerful tools is something called SpyJS. 
and that does a lot more in inspection. It does a lot more hooks into your Node application to see a lot deeper things like in, in watches and the call stacks, and um, it's super powerful. A lot of really good videos on SpyJS. So it's like, you feel like you're, you're not getting enough on the debugging side. I would, I'd first focus on just using the first three boxes that I have here on the slide. And if you feel like you wanna try and go like even farther and get really crazy, powerful debugging, it's much more complex, but with the complexity comes a lot more power and information, then check out SpyJS. I think WebStorm has integrated SpyJS into their um, editor in versions nine and 10. I can't remember if it goes back all the way back to eight. Okay, so that's like your Firehose Node.js uh, um, uh, uh, explanation of what the thing is. So you're all now super powerful Node.js developers. You can take over the world. Let's talk about how we can take advantage of this and using and uh, creating Office 365 uh, web applications or Office add-ins and SharePoint add-ins. So first, um, one of the nice things is that all extensibility in the Office, uh, Office platform uh, in this current phase that we're in um, is all web-based. So if you want to go through and build an add-in or extension to SharePoint, you're going to be building it as a web application. Uh, it's going to either live in SharePoint or it's going to live somewhere else. We call the, somewhere else we call those cloud apps or provider-hosted apps if you're familiar with those. Any extensions we do for Office, so using Outlook or Excel or Word or PowerPoint, all of those are also done using a little website and it's gonna be living inside of the hosting Office application, Outlook, Word, Excel, all these other, and all the other Office applications. One of the neat things about that is that even though it's running inside of that application and even though it is a website, once you've installed that application, for example, in Outlook, everywhere it will live in uh, load in every Outlook application that you're using, from the Outlook web app, web app that we have in Office 365, to the Office applic Outlook application we have on our Windows desktops, to on uh, o to the Mac for um, off for sorry Office for Mac, Mac for Office. There's a new product for you. I'm going to get in trouble with that one. Um, I'll trademark that real quick. Um, and uh, uh, we also have Office running on the iPad. Uh, Microsoft is, is releasing, is, is, is uh, still in the release phase of getting it full parity across the, all the different um, clients that we have um, uh, where Office exists to have support for apps. But because they're web applications, they will run in all these different places, all right? Um, and then finally, we can also just build a standard web application that takes advantage of the Office 365 APIs to dig into stuff. So that's what I show in the Express talk this week, is having, an Office, uh, having a web app that runs on a Raspberry Pi that integrates with Azure Active Directory and Office 365 APIs to get data and show that data uh, inside of our uh, applications. So um, they're all just websites, web applications, using web APIs. The, the cool thing about this platform, though, is that the underlying tech that we use is really completely irrelevant. It's just HTML, CSS, and you're gonna to wanna to have some interactivity, so JavaScript. How you get that surfaced to the hosting app does not matter. Microsoft does not care. You do whatever you wanna do, right? So we can do ASP.NET, we can do Node, we can do PHP, we can do Ruby, we can host it in Azure, AWS, doesn't matter, wherever you host it, or even on a Raspberry Pi. So Node.js, just like ASP.NET, is just another option. Right? It's not a better option, just another option. So a couple of things you want to consider if, you, if you're interested in getting into Node.js and doing a development with Office. So first of all, there are no wizards. There are no, and I don't mean like the pointy hat guys with the cane. I mean, but there's like no wizards that we have in the editors. In Visual Studio, there's really nothing there that's going to help us so much with the, if we're doing a Node-based app, web application uh, in Visual Studio. We're not going to be able to do things like the connected service stuff. It's not going to, it's not going to add all the code for us in the, the uh, NuGet packages because we're not doing NuGet packages. We're doing NPM and using Node Package Manager. The creation of the Azure AD application, you're going to do that through the Azure portal. You're going to do that through the management portal. You're not going to do that through Visual Studio, right? Um, you don't have any SDKs that are really there for you. Now, that's kind of true and that's kind of not true because guys at Microsoft, you see, are actually posting some Node packages to the NPM registry that are kind of wrapping some of the different APIs we have for the Office 365 APIs. I'm working on a couple as well that I'll be publishing up there as well. It's all community kind of driven. Um, I'm not aware of any effort by Microsoft at the moment that's con uh, concentrated building out like SDKs or the node packages 
uh, for the Office 365 APIs, but they're REST APIs. You don't need SDKs. You can do whatever you want with these things. The authentication flow, well, if it's all client side, then you, in one sense, you don't need it. So what I'm gonna show you with the, with, um, the Outlook app at the end, um, I don't need to worry about authentication in, in, in the one that I'm doing. But if I did need to worry about it, then we have a couple different options. So if it's all client side, I can use Azure AD's support for the OAuth implicit flow and the relatively new library that they have called ADALJS. Uh, I'm gonna show that in my session tomorrow when we talk about TypeScript and Angular uh, for, um, for uh, uh, Office 365 apps. Um, that's really cool because that means that I don't have to do anything server side to be able to um, protect the access token. Another thing that we have though, if I'm doing server side uh, style stuff, then I can use ADAL, the ADALJS uh, library for Node. So there's one ADAL, I think it's just called Node-ADAL is the name of the NPM package. That's the one that I'm using in the Raspberry Pi uh, website, or the Node.js website that I ran on the Raspberry Pi in the Express talk. So let me, let's, before we uh, go any further here, why don't we just uh, take some time and just start looking at a couple demos here. So we got plenty of time. So let me go ahead and switch over. Now, all the demos that I'm gonna show you here, first thing to show you is this repository. Now I'll have a link to this at the end of the slides or you can jot it down now. Um, it's just github.com slash andrewconnell slash prez dash 0365 dash node. And what you'll see in there are two different uh, folders. So if I just kind of zoom in real quick, there's two folders. Okay, I lied, there's three, but don't worry about the, the first one. That doesn't have any code in it. Um, that's got two different projects in there. One's node 0365 web. Now, if you're interested and you've been seeing the stuff that I did at the Express Talk, that's the project that's coming from the Express Talk, okay? The other one, the Office Add-in Outlook, that's the one that I'm gonna show, we're gonna focus on in this session, okay? That's all done using TypeScript. Both of these are done using TypeScript. Um, now, I do a lot of this, I'm doing all my development here uh, on, uh, on, a, on a Mac, uh, so I'm on OS X, and I'll tell you one thing that I've learned really quick about this, and there's one thing that Visual Studio does for you as a developer, that you don't really appreciate it until you try to do this same thing on OS X, and you're like, oh my, you know when you, the first time you install Visual Studio, and you build a website, and you wanna, you say that website has to be HTTPS, so you get HTTPS localhost, whatever the port is, and you hit F5, and if you think way back when you first built that machine, and the first time you ran Visual Studio to do that, it said, hey, you don't have a self-signed cert. Do you want me to go ahead and create a self-signed cert and trust it on this, on this uh, machine? Do you guys remember that far back? Yeah, and then you just clicked yes. Oh my God, that yes check, that yes button, you have no idea what that thing does for you in, when I'm sitting here on OS X. It is a royal pain to go through and to create a self-signed cert and to get it trusted and everything on a Mac. So if you're on OS X, there's this uh, file here that I explained. Here's all the stuff you have to do. It's, it's great, I mean, it's, it's almost, it's absolute lunacy in the sense that uh, there's a part here where it says, in the, after the dialogue comes up, click always trust, and then after it gets added to the system chain, open it up again, and then say always trust it again, because the first time didn't really always trust it. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's like through the first time, like going, no, 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 we really want you to trust it. So you gotta tell me you gotta trust it twice. I'm like, what is this, is there a special handshake on this machine? So. Anyway, that's where the code is. You guys can go grab that code and take a look at it. Now, before we kind of dive into this, let's go run the app so you can see what this thing does. So I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna go into my, um, go into my terminal and I'm gonna go ahead and start up my server. So I'm just gonna say uh, ss-port8000. Dash, dash nope, that's not the right one. Is that the right one? Wait, that's not right. I just blanked. I think it's node src server server.js, you just saw my demo for tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so now we got a, a website, our website is now running here on HTTPS colon slash slash some uh, port uh, colon 8843, so that's my secure port. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna um, go into my Outlook web access. So, or my Outlook web app. So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna log in and I can't type when I'm standing up. I think that's a thing. I think when you stand up or when you plug a monitor cable in, you can't type. 
Okay, so what is this app gonna do? Now, it's a contrived sample, but what this guy is gonna do, don't worry about losing my data, it's a trial sub, it's gonna expire in a minute. Not in a minute, hopefully. Hopefully it expires after Friday. Um, but what this app is gonna do is that I want to be able to find potential customers in an email. And so my rudimentary logic says, let's look at all the text in the body of the email, and when we find a word, that is surrounded by spaces and it starts with a capital letter, then we think that might be someone's last name. So let's take that and let's go query our CRM system and find that user in, the, in our CRM system, all right? And if we find that user, then let's, if we find somebody, if we, or sorry, let me back up. If we find words that could be last names, then we'll activate our Outlook add-in as an option. And if, it, if I click on it, it'll open up, take all those candidates, send them to a Node.js uh, REST API, or a REST API implemented in Node.js, that will then call some other web service or go look up in my CRM system to see, hey, can this, uh, is this person uh, one of our customers? So for example, if I come over here, I click on my order request, there's the body of the email, and you saw it took a second, but that little gray box popped up that said customer lookup. So I'm looking through all of this lipsum orum stuff, and it said, you know what, there might be a last name in here. So when I click on this, what's going to happen is it's gonna take all those words and send them back to that web server that's running on my local machine here, and it found one match. So if I come over here and I look at over here in the, in the console or in the, in the terminal, you can see that it says I'm executing a query and it's running off to services.odata.org. So what I'm doing is I'm using this endpoint here. You're wondering, well, where does Node.js come into this? So, I'm using the public service uh, sample service at the, at the odata.org website uh, for Northwind to go look up different customers. Look at that endpoint, that's HTTP, all right? Now what I would really like to do is instead of going back to the server to go call that web service, I'd rather just go straight to that web service from Outlook, right? But I can't, why? Because right above that you see I'm hosting the website at HTTPS. What's going on? Every add-in that you use in Office, every Office add-in is a website, and Office will only load add-ins from an HTTPS endpoint. If that website that I loaded from, HTTP, from HTTPS tried to make a cross-domain call to an HTTP endpoint, every single browser in the world is going to say, no, nah, you can't do that. That's an unsecure, dangerous kind of a thing. We're not going to let you, we're not gonna let you shoot your feet off. We're going to put a safety on the gun. So I had to come up with a way to say, well, how do I call this open service? And I just said, well, then let's just make my own little web server that's got a REST API that's gonna call that thing for us. It's demo code, don't shoot me here, okay? But if you think about it, you wouldn't be calling it like this. You'd probably be talking to Salesforce, or you'd be talking to Dynamics, or some other CRM or line of business app. It's just an example, all right? So I'm making a call, and you see it's looking at all these different things. It even thought that Ariel is that was somebody's name, which it actually is, but Helvetica I don't think is somebody's name. Um, it's because this email that I sent is actually an HTML e e uh, email, so even Calibri's in there too, but Calibri's pretty cool. You go out and have a few drinks with her. She's very nice. She tells some great jokes. Come back over here to this one. We'll look at, if I, I open this guy up, what I'm doing here, this is actually a note, a, a, sorry, a, uh, an Angular um, application that's running on my machine, on my laptop, and when I click on this guy, it shows me the details of Pascal. If I come over here to this other person, I've got three people that I've listed. John Doe is not listed in the Northwind service, but you can see it actually went out and found these other two people, and when I click on them, I find them, jump back to the customer list, click on them, go back, see, their, see them as well. So this Angular application uses something called material design, which is the design language which is the Google design language that there's a whole Angular piece to it as well. So you've seen the app, kind of pretty easy to understand, right? Let's see the code, how do we actually do this? So let's kill this guy off, well, not Maria, we don't wanna kill Maria, she's cool too. And let me switch over to the code here. And yeah, web server stopped. Okay, so I'm gonna show this to you using Visual Studio Code, the new editor that uh, Microsoft announced in the keynote this week. So how does this thing work? Well, let me just give you kind of a little bit of a tour of what the source looks like. This is the entire repository that I showed you in GitHub just a minute ago. So there's some stuff down here. There's the readme we saw a minute ago. There's the self-signed search stuff. You see I've got a couple of the keys listed right here. Those two keys, the, dots, the cert and the key, one of them is the public key, or sorry, one is, the, one is the public certificate, one of them is the private certificate. One of them is used by my application. 
One of them is trusted by my, uh, my browser and my uh, MacBook here, uh, so that everything's nice and secure, so that it knows that it will trust um, requests coming from this certificate or from this site. I then have all these different tooling things in here. This is, a lot of this is TypeScripting stuff. Um, we're not gonna really dive into all that, but just know that you've got a sample here that shows you how to use uh, the libraries definitely typed uh, for TypeScript to have strong typing. There's other sessions that talk about TypeScript this week. Um, the gulp file, I use that to compile all my TypeScript down to JavaScript to run my tests, to do linting against my TypeScript to make sure that the code is in good style and I'm doing things like having spaces between my Lambda expressions and all that. And then um, I also have the, uh, the standard bower.json to get client packages into my application and package.json to get all of my NPM packages in. Okay, that's all fine and good. Let's look at the application. So the application is boxed up inside of this source folder. So there's app, there's public, and there's server. So server is the server side component of my application. And if I go look at the, the TypeScript for this guy, let's look at what this looks like. Now this is gonna be creating the Express Web App, okay? The, the Express Web Application. So I'm importing a few things here. You can think of those as, um, uh, like using statements in like ASP.NET or in a standard C-sharp file. And then I'm coming in and also doing, uh, uh, requiring a couple extra pieces here. So like HBS is the handlebars uh, view engine. And then I'm also including my own uh, file from the controllers subfolder slash index.js, all right? Or in this case, it's index, well, it's index.js, but it's can compile down, it's index.ts, but it'll compile down to index.js. Node will only be looking at the JS files. The editors are only looking at the TypeScript files. Make sense? So then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an instance of Express right here on line 12. I'm then gonna go through and I'm gonna set, I'm gonna register the different partials, which what that does is it says, where are all of your views stored for your MVC style views? I put them in the views subfolder because that's kind of how they do it in ASP.NET MVC, so it's familiar, all right? Very similar style. Um, I've built this app with thinking of ASP.NET in mind um, because that's what I'm most familiar with and I thought that what you guys would be familiar with as well. I then want to tell Express that his view engine that he's gonna use, he's got a configuration setting called view engine, is gonna use the engine called HBS, handlebars for node. Um, I'm also gonna set the property called views, which is what um, uh, handlebars is looking at, in to look at the current directory that I'm in, that underscore underscore dir name is like a global variable in node that says what folder are we currently in, or what, what folder are we currently running in, and it's inside of the slash views subfolder. I'm then gonna set up a couple static routes. So whenever you see something that goes to slash public on my website, I want you to go to the static route, go up one level to public. Because remember, we're inside server. Remember over here, if you remember my folder structure, we're inside server, we're running inside of server because that's where server JS is. So when you go to slash public, I want you to go up to this folder right here. So slash public slash content slash app CSS is gonna be found up in this folder up here because I just told it that's where I want it to go. I also have over here, I say whenever you go to public slash vendor, I want that to translate to all the Bower components I'm pulling down. So when I'm trying to get Angular, you'll see in the index.html file in a minute, it's actually gonna be looking at public slash vendor. I'm just remapping that to a different folder structure on my machine. And then whenever you go to slash app, this is the style I use for my client side applications. My Angular app is gonna live in slash app. So I keep that separate from public. Um, now let's load all my controllers. We'll see that in just a minute, okay? Let's start up the web server. This is gonna go through and build up a little object here. It's got a two properties, a key and a cert. So I'm gonna read those two certificate files in. I'm then going to figure out what port we're gonna run on. Now why is that important? It says, go look at the current process, look at the environment and the port we're running on and use that. But if that doesn't exist and has not been set, use 8443. Why is that important? Because when I take the same application and I deploy it to, Azure web, to an Azure website, sorry, an Azure web app, when I use the SSL endpoint, it's gonna be 443. It's gonna be defined as 443 and I want my app to default to that. But if I'm going localhost, I'm not setting up an environment variable, so it's gonna to go to, to this variable I have here, or this number I have here, of port 8443. 
Next up, I'm going to start the web server using these options, which uh, right here from the different certificate stuff, right up here, those are my options. I'm going to use this Express app that I created to start up the web server, and I'm going to be listening on that port. And then I just wrote out in the code right here, here's what we're listening on. So now we got our web server running. But how does some stuff actually work inside of Node? Well, if I come over here, and if I look at the, um, uh, one thing I mentioned a second ago is I said we initialized all the controllers. So I need to tell it, just like I did up here for all my static routes, I need to tell it what are all my dynamic routes that I'm going to be listening to. So you know in ASP.NET uh, MVC, we have that uh, configuration file where we define all of our routes and we can do like wildcards and all that stuff. I could do that same thing here. But for simplicity, I've set up some explicit routes. <coughs> I tried to mute that. I'm sorry. Um, so what I have here is a controller factory. And you're seeing a lot of files over there on the left-hand side. It's because they're the TypeScript files that have been comp compiled down to JavaScript. And then they have a map file in there. And actually, let me clean that up. I got a, I got a good little, um, let's see, we got gulp clean TS. All right, so I cleaned it up, come over here, and then we just, it just deleted all the JavaScript stuff that was crazy. So we need, I don't need to worry about that right now. We're not going to rerun the app. So if you recall, I have this controller factory. And where did I get that? Well, that was coming from right up here on line nine when I required or I pulled in controller slash index. So that's going to go through and create an instance here of controllers that's got a function called init on it. That's going to be grabbing this file right here, index.ts. And so here, this is all TypeScript. I'm creating a class. That class has a constructor. I've passed in the Express app, but I'm not doing anything with it in the constructor. He's got a function there called init. So what init is going to do is he's going to go create instances of the home controller and of the API controller. So here you see I've got those two references at the top. What's the home controller doing? The home controller is just creating essentially the home page for the application. What happens when you go to slash? So on line 16, it says when you go to the root of the application, I'm going to pass in a request object using TypeScript. I said that this is of type express.request. I'm doing that using the definitely typed definitions that we can get in TypeScript to um, cast that dot request to get much more intelligence around it. Um, and then I have uh, also passing in a response. And then again, using TypeScript, I'm using a Lambda expression here instead of using the function notation, and saying, when you get a request for the root of the website, I want you to render home slash index. And that's very similar inside of ASP.NET control, ASP MVC controllers, where you just say view, and you put the name of the view, and it figures out what controller you're in and the subfolders and how they work. Here, I've explicitly said that I want you to grab the view that's in home slash index. So I go to views, home, and then index.hbs. This is my handlebars piece. Now here, there's nothing fancy in here. All this is doing is it's loading in all the stuff for my Angular application. So there's the Angular um, app that you see there on lines four and five, creating the module. I've then got some services that I'm creating here for an office service, a custom, customer service, and then some controllers as well. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'll go into some of the Angular stuff, but I prefer to, we're going to stick more on the, on the type sorry, on the Node.js stuff, uh, and show you how that works first. Now, this file right here is actually getting merged uh, the same way that we do with like an underscore layout or share view that we have in ASP.NET MVC. This layout.hbs that we have in the root here, this is my main HTML file or my master page, you could say, um, inside of my, of my application. So here I've gone through standard stuff. There's all my vendor scripts that I've defined. Remember here, they're in slash public slash vendor. That's going to map to the Bower components. So then I go slash jQuery.dist. So there's jQuery distribution, and then there's jQuery.min. See how that works out? Over here, though, I'm also going to make a reference to something called office.js. That's coming from Office 365. And when you're creating Office add-ins, that's the thing that gives you the plumbing or the context from your web application to your hosting uh, Office app, like Outlook or Word. So for, for Office, um, and I'll show you this file. I, I will call this file out in a minute. Or uh, sorry, I will call it the, my Office services. This is how I'm able to reach into the body of the email to get all those words and find the, the things I'm looking for. Or for instance, I'm able to uh, look for specific numbers or 
things that look like mailing addresses or phone numbers or shipping codes inside of an email. Or if I'm in Excel, I can see the range of things that have been selected. Or I can write to a range of stuff inside of a spreadsheet. Or in Word, I can grab the things that are selected from the document and use them inside my Task Pane app. I can use my write back to uh, where the cursor is inside my Word doc. Office.js is going to do all that work for me. Okay. Um, then I've just got a few CSS files. And then at the very bottom here, I've got the triple handlebar notation at the bottom for on line 29. And that's what's injecting in my entire view of index.hbs is being put where body is right there. OK? So you've kind of seen now how like the home controller is being loaded. And before we go there, let's talk about the REST API. So I come over here and I look at this API controller right here. What is this guy doing? So over here, I'm going to, again, just get a reference to um, the Express, uh, um, my Express library that's for you doing, working with um, the Express web server. And then you see that other thing there for request. And you're thinking, wait a minute, don't you already have a request in Express? No, this is different. Request is an NPM package that you can use to make HTTP or HTTPS calls um, uh, from Node.js to make easy requests outside of, uh, uh, outside of your Node.js application. Uh, for you client-side devs, this is similar to how I would do jQuery.ajax. Or to you um, Angular guys, this is how I would do the um, dollar $HTTP or dollar $resource uh, requests. So requ uh, HTTP requests. I just wish they'd given this a different name. How do you make a request? You use request. Sorry? Be a little more specific? No, no it's request. Like, uh, okay. So we'll create this API controller. He, his constructor, I'm going to load up a bunch of different routes. So down here, I have a couple different routes that I've defined. I have a route for slash API. Listen for the request slash API slash customers. And when you get that, I want you to call the function on this, on this class called qu underscore query customers. What about if I want to look them up by a specific name or by a specific ID? I can pass those things in. And notice at the very end of those different um, uh, paths or routes that I've defined on lines 19 and 20, I actually have a little variable that I've defined at the end of that request. I have a colon in front of it looking for one called customer names or customer ID. If I scroll down a little bit farther here, here's the, here's the handler for querying customers. Now I've called this the, um, the two variables that are being passed in is exp request for expresses request because we already have a thing on the page defined at, or on the file defined as request. That's the thing that's going to make the HTTP calls for me. Here what I'm doing, creating a reference to my endpoint over to my Northwind service over in the odata.org site. I'm then going to create an options object using TypeScript. I'm typecasting that so that I can, or typing that so that I, I know that I've got a method property, I've got a, a headers object that I can define. And then a little bit farther down, I'm going to issue my request. So I can say request, I pass in the endpoint. Here are the options I want to use. When you're done with that request, I'm using a little bit of TypeScript notation there. You're going to get an error object, a response object, and a body object. Pass those into the next function using that Lambda expression. I'm going to write out to the console the body of the request that I'm, that I'm um, uh, making the request to. Sorry, on line 37, I write out the URL that we're making the request to. And on line 39, I'm writing out the response that I got back. And then ex response dot send is essentially saying, OK, Express, send this back to the requester for this endpoint. Don't send HTML. Don't send, don't route them to some view that I'm using handlebars for. Send them the entire body of the thing that they requested. And I'm just passing back what I got back from the Northwind service. It's not so bad, right? It's pretty straightforward. It's JavaScript. You got to get used to that kind of piece to it. It's, this is specifically is TypeScript. I personally am a big fan of TypeScript because I've been a server-side guy for a long time. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a JavaScript developer per se. I per se I'm more of somebody who's been hacking my way through JavaScript for the last decade, right? How many of you feel like that? Usually ask that question to standard like .NET developers. It's like, how many of you are JavaScript developers? I'm like, eh, yeah, I'm a JavaScript developer. It's like. How many of you have just been like me and you've just been hacking your way through it for the last 10 years? And like 90% of the room's like going, okay, that was me, sorry. I saw some cool site that had a cool drop down. I review source, grabbed their JavaScript library, got it working on my site. Every once in a while, these things showing up in the console that were errors. I loaded it up with a bunch of alerts and figured it out, right? You people laugh. You've done that. Everyone's done that. Use console.log, don't use alerts. And I'm like, oh, I know I'm supposed to. Alerts work. Anyway. 
Um, next thing here, we've got uh, just another request. This is another one of our endpoints. Query the customer by name. And this way here, I'm just building up a special request. You can see there on lines 50 through 56, I'm building a filter, um, an OData fil standard filter request where I'm passing the different customer names. And I'm just doing if, if it's this guy or this guy or this guy or this guy or girl or girl or girl, gal, I guess. And then I'm just making another request. Same thing down here, filtering it by a specific ID. And that's the node app. That's it. Doesn't look that bad, does it? The hard part that I found for this and doing the, when I was first getting into this was um, honestly first, the hardest part about this entire thing was getting the HTTPS, uh, getting, hosting an HTTPS web server um, from Mac and, or from a, a, a MacBook and, um, uh, and making sure that the web app, uh, my, my browser, or my, my application would trust the certificate that came back. Because if it wouldn't trust the cert, it wouldn't load the page inside of Outlook. That was the hardest part of this. The rest of it, it's not that hard biting off these different things. You got an endpoint, you've basically now seen everything that you need to be able to do. You know how to render a view, you know how to do a little bit of logic. I could have, when I did, um, where is it? I come over here and do under, where's my home controller? Right here, on, when, I, when I rendered out the, the home view, see where that comment is where it says a model would go here? If I pass back some object on this, I could have said something along the lines of, um, like, page title is, hi, mom. I'm at build. She has no idea what that is, but she, she's like, oh, I'm so happy for you. Um, <laughs> Seriously, that was Facebook this morning. You're presenting at Build, that's cool. What is it? I don't really know. Are you actually like creating things? I'm like, no, just like videos. <laughs> but I'm not doing that. Um, so I passed that back, and over here in the view, if I wanted to display that, I'd say something like throw an H1 up here and then say uh, page title like that. And that's how I go through and bind that, bind that object there because the, now the page, this page is bound to that, to that model, that view model that I passed back in that object. And so it binds it like that. So you've seen how to do data binding with views. You've seen how to actually render back the views. You've seen how to do a REST API or how to host different APIs, how to make calls out. That's Node.js for you. I and mean, that's, that's it. That's all you're really going to have to do to be able to build these different applications. Um, the other piece to this, and because I have a little bit of extra time, uh, and then if anybody has any questions, I can open up for questions. Um, there is one little thing here that you, I ran into um, because I was using Angular to host the application. I, really, I love Angular. Makes, it's really easy to build uh, client-side web apps. Um, if, you're familiar, if you're not familiar with Angular, you're going to be a bit lost on what I'm about to talk about here. So I'll do my best to explain what's going on. Um, inside of an Angular app, you are generally going, you, you create an Angular application and then that's going to be bound to a certain part of the page and generally we bind it to the body of the page. So basically saying it's a single page app and it's going to take over the entire page so I bind it there. So you would normally see on that body tag, uh, you'd normally see a directive that looks something like data-ng-app equals app. Check out that cool intelligence from the Visual Studio Code. That's pretty cool. Um, no, I, yeah, I won't go there. Anyway, so there's app, so it's binding to app right there. Inside of your Angular application, you would norm, you create an app right here. So I call this app Outlook app. Usually I would have done that and everything would have just been fine. So I would have, this would have been called, in the sample I just gave you, I just said app. So what that would have done now is that that would have created, that would have created the Angular app and it would have bound it to that part of the body. But Angular and OfficeJS kind of have something going on like this. Don't really know what's going on here, but it's okay. It's not that big of a deal. The way you get around it is that instead of on that file that you just saw me do this piece to, there's a reason why I have an ID called container on my body tag. It's because what I did is at once I've gone through and I've created my Angular application, I do some configuration, I then have to bootstrap Angular. Now what happens is, is that when you're going through and you're building an Office add-in, it is your responsibility to call this function office.initialize within, I believe it's five seconds from your app starting to load. And if it doesn't do that within five seconds, then the hosting Office application 
will simply show a little tiny friendly yellow screen of death message that says, sorry, application don't work. We can't, it's not, it's not opening. Do you wanna try it again? And you click retry and sometimes that works. And if it does work, sometimes you didn't have issues. But regardless, it's giving the user a good experience, a better experience, so that they don't feel like this app is opening up and it's got a white screen and they're waiting forever. At least Microsoft can say, hey, something happened with that add-in. It's not our fault. It's the add-in's fault. Or at least you know that there's some feedback there. You're responsible for calling office.initialize. Um, the office.js file is going to be looking for that function and calling it within the first five, within five seconds. And if it doesn't find it, then that's when it has that, that it throws that little yellow error message. Office.initialize, I'm defining it right here and saying, hey, look, once Office has initialized, then initialize my Angular application. And I do that by calling angular.bootstrap. If I do it, the, if I let Angular uh, bootstrap itself before office.initialize goes, this kind of thing happens. And it will drive you crazy trying to figure it out. So I just saved you about a whole night and a boatload of coffee in a hotel room in the, in the Midwest trying to figure this out because that was my life about four months ago. All right. Um, so here I'm just bootstrapping it. Now the last thing I'll show you in the last few minutes I have, what's the other office piece? The rest of this is just, it's all an Angular app. There's nothing, there's nothing fancy about it. Here's the one thing that's office add-in E. There's a new word. I need to get all of the word candidates from an email. So how am I gonna do that? I need to use Office JS. So here's what they've done. Down on line 26, I'm saying office.cast item. So look at the current email, and I want to look at the item that I'm reading, the current email that I'm reading, and I wanna get all of the, the con I wanna get a reference to that item. So look at office.context.mailbox.item. It basically says, Look at the current thing that's selected. Um, it's then going to say current email dot get regex matches dot possible name. So what is that doing? That's going to give me back an array of all the possible capital word uh, candidates that could be last names. How is it doing that? Well, inside of the content, there's an app.xml file. For those of you who've done an Office add-in, you're familiar with this. This is the manifest for the Office app. This is the thing that I'm going to install in Outlook or Excel or Word or is what is used in the store when you, to install the application within your, um, your Office client. And when I say within the store, I mean the Office store when I go get the add-ins. This is the thing that basically tells Office in the store what is this thing and where does it load. So I did this, I had to do this thing by scratch because I didn't do it in Visual Studio. But if you're using Visual Studio, there are project types that will build this whole thing out. Nice little wizard. What kind of thing you want to build? What kind of permissions you need? Blah, blah, blah. Does it all for you. So what does it have in it? Well, it's got a, an ID to it, a version number. There's the, who actually created it. What is the name of it? What's the description? What's the pretty little picture to use? Now, the rest of it, it gets, is, is going to change based on the kind of thing you're, the office add in your building. So in this case here, I'm building a mailbox application. So this is gonna be going inside of Outlook. Other options are things like document or spreadsheet or workbook, I can't remember off the top of my head. These requirements here, this says this application is only intended to be used on places where the, we are doing the 1.1 version of office.js. So why does that matter? Because I might be doing something inside of an, of an Office application and leveraging Office.js that has new things inside of version 1.1 that were not in version 1.0. And while all the web clients have the latest version running, someone may not have updated their version of Outlook on their Windows machine or on their iOS device on their phone. And they might not be able to get those different things. So I said, this one only works if you've got that installed. Otherwise, don't do it. Down here, what are the, this part right here is for Outlook, and it says, I'm looking at the item, the item read type form. There's also one for composing emails. And it says, hey, look, if you find a match where this, this add-in can be activated, where should you load the web app? You should load it from localhost 8443. And that's the height. The permission that we need is to read the item that's currently selected. Now, here's the cool part where you get that, the list of all those people. I'm creating a rule collection and I'm gonna add them together. The first rule is the item is a message and the form type is currently a read. The next thing is I can choose things like give me the whole body of the email 
or look for specific entities that Outlook knows about, like contacts or email addresses or whatever. But in this case here, I said, let's look for a regular expression. Look at all the, look at the body of the uh, email as HTML. Here's the regular expression. And I want you, whenever you find it, to look to call that possible name. And what that does right there is it is matching to possible name right there. Take the regular expression matches, dot possible name is the matches, and now I have a collection of all these different people. And that's it. So it's kind of an abrupt finish here, but what, I just, what we have here is you see how to build a Node.js application for an Office add-in, how to use it using Node.js for the server-side piece, and then how to also go through and build the add-in using office.js and getting data from Outlook. So with that, I'll just pull the slides up for the very end, and we are all done. So I appreciate you guys sticking around, and oh, my slide, there. So there's the demos you can get from everything. Call to action, go check out Node.js, go check out io.js, and I'm remiss in putting another link up there. Also check dev.office.com to get all the links for doing Office add-ins and some more information about it. All right there. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer any questions now that we're all done. But thank you very much. So. Yeah. So is this only, um, I mean, does it support like Office 2015 or is it only the newest Office Yep. Yeah. So good question. So the question was, does this only support Office 2013? Th this Office add-in model of um, where everything's like a web app. So the old model we had was Visto. This model is Office 2013. So Office 2013. Um, Office 365, um, the Office apps for iPad for, or for iOS, uh, for Android, and for um, uh, also the Office, I'm going to get the name wrong, Office for Mac 2016, Office 2013 for Mac, 2016 for Mac, something like that. Now, with that being said, the add-in support is not in every single client in every single platform. So web is kind of like the first big, web and Win32 and Win are the two big ones that you're going to see uh, have support across the board. Um, the one they announced the keynote is um, add-ins for Excel on the iPad. Um, and then there are, there was uh, another one for uh, apps for running an Outlook on the Mac. Um, but what they're doing is they're really trying to focus and make sure that they have a consistent experience across all of them. So you're not seeing like stuff kind of rushed out, but it's a high priority for them to push them out to where apps, all, this model is running on all the different clients that they have, and they're moving at a pretty quick pace. There's a, there was a session yesterday, the developer keynote for um, Office 365, where there was a good matrix that was shown that shows where they are, how soon they are, how close things are, and all that. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it's, 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 it's Office 2013. Where Office 2013 works, that's all I meant. Yeah, Office 2013. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Will it still support legacy add -ins? So the, uh, the, the Office 2013 still does Visto, yes. But that is only for, like, Windows, yeah, Outlook for, 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 um, for Windows. Um, that's, you would, those add-ins won't work in the web clients, iOS, Android, all that stuff. Good question. So the question was, will it, will it still support the existing extensibility model we have with Visto, Visual Studio Tools for Office? So yes in one spot, no everywhere else. Cool? Cool. Thanks a lot for sticking around, guys. Last session of the day. It was always fun.